Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, July 20th, 2023, let's get into it. First off, let's listen to a little bit of Scott Ritter, my hero, I tell you what, he's doing great reporting all over YouTube. I uh, haven't seen him on Rumble, man, I think he needs to branch out, but I imagine he's on some other channels. He got recognized in Russia by Lazarov. Uh, Lazarov, by the way, is, I know that you, if you hate Russians, you wouldn't want to see that, but uh, he's an extremely intelligent diplomat out of Russia, and uh, for Scott Ritter, that's quite an honor. My God, uh, you know, be like shaking the hand of, um, of Putin. <laughs> All you Putinators out there. Let's listen to Scott for just a second while I get things organized. How how did you find this NATO summit for Ukraine? What was the outcome? Is there any outcome for Ukraine this summit? Well, I mean, the outcome is that Ukraine is doomed. Uh, Ukraine has no chance of survival. This, uh, this summit didn't offer a uh, lifeline to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's hope, going in only hope, was that they would be able to combine a successful counteroffensive uh, that would put pressure on Russia to accept a negotiated peace with a NATO ready to pull the trigger at a moment's notice to allow Ukraine in. Um, you know, the, the, the goal was the moment a ceasefire could be implemented. Uh, meaning that the, the active phase of the war has stopped, that NATO would immediately invite uh, Ukraine as a member, locking in, preventing Russia from continuing uh, counteroffensive or, or con continuing military operations because now Ukraine would be protected by Article 5. And then the goal would be to uh, put pressure on Russia to get them to uh, withdraw from Ukrainian territory. This was the hope. Uh, the counteroffensive has failed miserably from a Ukrainian perspective. Uh, you know, 26,000 dead, um, thousands of destroyed equipment uh, just in the last couple of days, 330 plus tanks destroyed, many of them. All right, we're gonna get into those numbers later in the video. Uh, Scott goes on about them from there. Every now and then, every now and then, you come across something that just blows your mind and i'm going to tell you what i today i was because i had to go uh, i'm just like you i had to go to the doctor and i i couldn't sleep last night i whenever they got to draw my blood you know i've had cancer twice i've been in the hospital more times than you could ever imagine with a broken neck and everything else so my veins i mean you you i and i i told the guy i said man i need to i need your top vein guy man if he's going to grab a vein he grabbed it first try, baby, and I was real happy about that. So that was good. Anyway, there was a, there's a channel on YouTube you have got to watch. Oh, my goodness. I love promoting other people. That's what it's all about. Uh, it's called Dialogue Works. Dialogue Works. I wish I knew the guy, that, his name that runs the channel, but he had an interview with Andre... Mark Yanov, Andrei Manyanov. And uh, from what I understand, I think he might be a Russian that's living here in the United States. He's written a number of books, uh, extremely intelligent individual. And man, I, I, I got into the interview and I was riveted. And, uh, and oh my God, I have never laughed so hard in my whole life because <laughs> he expressed everything that I've been trying to tell you. Oh my God, this guy was amazing. And, uh, and, 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 so I said, well, okay, uh, I'll just present some parts of this interview to my audience, you know, because I don't want to, you can't, you know, you can't steal somebody else's material. I, I can't, I don't want to steal the whole interview. All I got to tell you is just go watch the whole damn video, okay, on Dialogue Works on YouTube. It, 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 it will blow your mind, but I'm going to try to chop it up as best I can, but it, it's kind of like every second of it was just filled with just great dialogue, great information. Now, his accent makes him hard to understand, so I'm just going to try to put it all together. So the, uh, the first part that I really liked, because uh, he's, he's a Russian, and uh, he just basically said that, and I've been telling you, of course, I always said Millie is a traitor, and Austin's a traitor. 
Uh, yeah, maybe that's extreme language that, that people have told me. They said, well, they're not necessarily traitors. They're just stupid. <laughs> and that's exactly what he said. He says, they're just fucking stupid. I said, well, you know what? You know, he's got a good point. Maybe they are just incredibly dumb people. Uh, they're politicians. They're not uh, generals. And he actually talked about the whole U.S. military in general and uh, how we are not prepared to fight a war uh, out of a paper bag, a conventional war. Now, of course, we could fight a nuclear war if we want to go that route and destroy the world. But uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that. Let's watch uh, his comments on the U.S. military, Millie, uh, the U.S. generals in general. Let's watch that. Why, why they were talking about these F-16s? For just more than eight months, they're talking about we're gonna give the Ukraine, we're gonna give Ukraine these weapons. They're gonna change the game. How, how do you say this? This second part of his comments. Okay, let me be very blunt. U.S. Army has absolutely zero people who understand how to fight this war. American uh, fighting doctrine, all their uh, field manuals, they are designed under one specific uh, overriding factor, which is, of course, uh, which is totally mythical, actually, America dominating the airspace, air, land, battle, you know, they call them different names, but in the end, just to counter, while Neely was speaking about it, next day, National Security Advisor to <laughs> President Biden, Jake Sullivan, one of the major proponents of this war crime, which is happening right now in Ukraine, he admitted we cannot send anything because of the air defenses. And then, of course, they have to understand that Russian Air Force is actually an extremely uh, effective and combat ready and tried in the real serious combat. And then what are you going to do? Yeah, you send the F-16s, they're going to burn, they're going to be shut down the same way as all those, you know, Wunderwaffe uh, sent from elsewhere. You already saw what happened to, uh, you know, five Patriots, Pack 3. They are gone, annihilated. What happened to German tanks, Leopard 2s, burned. So what's the difference? That NATO is not capable of fighting this war. I mean, NATO combined, not just United States, but United States and all those European lab dogs, they simply have no resources and military doctrine and command and control system in place, which can allow you to even uh, fight uh, Russians in this respect. Most political decision uh, making circles in the United States and Europe, they are highly uneducated and uncultured people. And I mean it, they have all those PhDs from some, you know, fraudulent organizations, you know, so, but you have to understand that uh, they really believe their own BS. I mean, literally, they pump them, uh, you know, it's like the uh, um, echo chamber. It is echo chamber. You have their totally subservient mass media, which are also stuffed with people with zero education, zero culture, who do not understand how the world works. And so they really kind of bounces off and amplifies itself. And they believe that they're so great that, you know, technologically we're so, you know, so, and it's all PR. And those people bought it into those PR, this PR. Again, I, I quote, there are obviously uh, people who do understand the situation. General Latif, I call him nonstop, but unlike me, he did, he's an insider from the uh, American uh, military industrial complex. For 20 years, apart from having PhD in physics, this he's a uh, major general in DARPA. So he was at the inception of the uh, basically whole development of the weapon systems, you know, uh, cutting edge for the United States. I quote him, much of what the West and its public and its political elite know about warfare is from the entertainment industry. It is all Hollywood and they really believe this garbage. They really believe that uh, the guys, uh, if like the latest Top Gun Maverick, it's, it's cringe worthy. it's impossible to watch. So yeah, the country which <laughs> owns a few 57s also has S-75s from 1950s, like which is air defense. It's so preposterous. And as Latif explains, he said, very often I had to explain to congressmen and senator, some senators and congressmen, that 
you cannot just launch, uh, you know, satellite and put it over the, you know, the desired place. There are physics laws, you know, gravitational laws, which uh, basically define how you launch those space assets, how you position them. But they wouldn't understand that. And that's what you have. I am on the record again. You can quote me on this. The intellectual level, intellectual level of modern political elites in the United States and uh, Europe is so low. Uh, it's well. Again, listen. Look at Annalena Baerbock. She wanted to turn 360 degrees. I mean, come on. I mean, what are we talking about? Why don't we go and get some? Well, actually, probably if you get some homeless guy somewhere from the from. Uh, uh, San Francisco, some of them accidentally might be actually, you know, math teacher or some, you know, or former uh, uh, software designer. They will know that 360 degrees is what going back to, you know, and they would probably do better job as their foreign secretary or minister of the foreign affairs than Annalena Baerbock. But look at them. Look at Lee Strauss. Look at Boris Johnson. The guy is a, comp uh, for, you know, he's an imbecile, okay? Look at Rishi Sunak, look at Macron, not to speak about, you know, the American president who doesn't even live in reality anymore. He lives in some, whatever, you know, astral, you know, uh, sphere somewhere. How do you talk to those people? And, but they do believe it. Take, get any American journalist, average American journalist. They are dumb as stumps. What is degree in journalism? It's not a degree, it's, it's garbage, it's trash. They give some, so, and when you look, what is degree in political science? Useless, fraudulent, uh, fraudulent thing, you know? And when you go over it, but these are the people who sit in those, uh, you know, uh, corridors of power. Look at many American generals. Some of them are lawyers, actually, and have degrees in political science and international relations. How about getting the real good degree in military science? But there you go. And then when you look at this, I mean, how how can you communicate with those people? Oh, man. And then, then, then he goes on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Then he went on from there and he wanted to talk about our politicians and, uh, and Western politicians as well. And so I got to, you know, I, it, it takes me a while. I'm, I had to cut, cut through, you know, a lot of the video. I don't want to present the whole damn thing. But, oh, my God, did he express my sentiment? You know, because I look at the, uh, uh, Schultz, uh, Macron, Trudeau, uh, Biden. You know, I mean, you look at all the Western leaders and you just think, how did these flipping idiots get elected in their countries? They're the dumbest people of the dumb on the planet. Let's what I mean. I can't express it any better than this. I can't express it any better than this. Let's watch what he has to say. Oh, my goodness gracious. This whole special military operation exposed NATO and the United States as paper tiger, both in terms of the military production and in terms of the uh, weapon systems. So, and what's left? Yeah, let's send the cluster of munitions. They have nothing more left. That's simple as that. Actually, when this war started, in this, this war of attrition, anybody knows that artillery are the king of battle. Yeah, and Russians called it the gods of war. How? If, if that was ob obvious from, from the beginning, why they decided to go to war with Russia? They knew that, that Ukraine going to get destroyed. Why they continue to send Ukraine and Ukrainians to this war? to encourage them, why they did that to Ukraine? Uh, first, you need to understand that most uh, European and American elites, I'm talking to political decision makers, are extremely uneducated and uncultured people. You have to keep this in mind. If you look attentively across the whole board of those people, be them Mr. Blinken, be them Jake Sullivan, be that Hillary Clinton or Obamas who are behind driving this war, Clintonites, you look at Mr. Uh, you know, uh, Biden, pardon me for using those uh, words. So you look at all those people from State Department, they are political appointees. They are people who have zero understanding of how world outside works. And then, of course, I am on the record, a record. I wrote three books about it. I write the fourth book. Everything 
America knows about Russia and Soviet Union is myth. It's garbage. It's caricature. And even uh, the deeply respected uh, by me, uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, he repeats this uh, uh, absolute caricature and lie basically about the Red Army, for example, because he even still thinks that Russia is, was some kind of Mordor, a gulag, you know, the one huge gulag and things of this nature. So those people, especially those economic types who never worked a day on the production floor, who never went into the coal mine or, you know, uh, extracted oil or worked on the CNC, computer numerical control machines, whose only uh, education are some abstract economic theories, they really thought that, okay, we throw those, you know, uh, proxies, which are Ukraine, we train and, you know, uh, uh, supply them with all kinds of their uh, equipment, so that by the 2022, it was uh, very well trained and very well equipped. Actually, the second army in Europe, it was better army than the uh, French army and British army combined. I'm going to say, okay, we'll throw them in. We impose sanctions on Russia and Putin regime falls. They hate Putin. They hate general the Russians. Uh, there are no, uh, most people in Washington, D.C., they hate Russian gods. I mean, they don't care if they kill children, you know, so they, it's fine, you know. Same goes for London, it's true there. And then because they're so uncultured, uneducated, and uh, they're uh, basically the only thing they knew in their present lives was this beating the crap out of their uh, basically defenseless Iraqi army in 1991, that's the only thing they know. That's their yard stick. They do not understand what the actual real war is and what the real economy is. And then you begin to look. So they thought, okay, let's throw them. Let's provoke Russia and see how Putin regime falls. Russia falls. We'll break it up. Then we get the access to the resources. And there you go. Well, what can I say? You cannot fix stupid. I am on the record and you can quote me. All, every single Ivy League school humanities departments in the United States have to be dissolved as providing no education, no value whatsoever. They are academic frauds and especially, as I already stated, academic uh, field of Russian studies in the West, it's a wasteland. It's a bunch of shysters who sell their expertise while having no ability to understand how the real economy works, how Russians view history, what is real history, and especially a real military history of Russia and Soviet Union are. So you cannot teach them. I mean, they live in this thing that uh, I, I have a very good litmus test. The army which worships General uh, George C. Patton as a genius for tank warfare is not going to win a single war. And that's simple like that. And there you go. Well, no, no, that, uh, he is correct in the sense that those people, they live in this delusional world, alternative reality, as I already stated. Give me any uh, basic, we're not talking about the uh, uh, political uh, people, but give me any uh, general like Petraeus or Kim from the so-called Institute of the Study of War, and to expose that they are ignorant people, they have no clue what they're talking about, you know, and they have no idea on the operational strategic thinking, precisely the levels where the wars are won. And uh, as I already stated, uh, these guys, they still think that they so, think they're so great because they beat the uh, crap out of the fourth rate army, you know, uh, after the half a year of unimpeded prepositioning of forces. And when you look at this, dudes, just how about you open uh, the real history of World War II and learn the fact that by the time, with all deepest respect for uh, heroism of American, British, you know, uh, Polish, Canadian, you know, uh, New Zealanders uh, and others who were landing in the D-Day, by that time, the Wehrmacht was finished pretty much. The creme de la creme of the European, not just German, but European military uh, elite, so to speak, have been finished off. The best soldiers have been finished off. The best of the Luftwaffe have been finished. So, and when you look at this, they do not understand the scales. 
and uh, they don't understand the scale, they don't understand the scope of the modern warfare, and they do not understand the scale and scope of European war, which was World War II. They simply don't. And give me any practical, with the exception of the legendary and outstanding American military historians like David Glantz and Jonathan House, uh, talk to anybody of them. They are propagandists. Most of them, they... Uh, they they still think that, for example, you know, what uh, Kursk battle was important, but you know, there were um, some you know engagements somewhere in Southeast Asia which really kind of broke their back. No, it didn't, because eighty percent of best of the Wehrmacht and European uh, allies have been annihilated in uh, by the Red Army. You know, and so what can I say? And they don't even know how it was annihilated. They don't. Not, they learned nothing. Ben Wallace. In, in an interview with BBC, said that Ukraine is turned into a battle lab, something like the, the, for for war technology. It's the same thing that the Ukrainian talking about. They're talk, they, they 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 said that Ukraine is the best testing ground for for NATO's weapons. When you accept this, when you send all those young men to the battlefield, when you kill all of them. What kind of morality is that? Oh, it's not only it's uh, not morality. It's a war crime. What is happening and crime against humanity, <clears throat> and that is why the uh, uh, the establishment of the real international war crime tribunal is being in works with the participation of Russian investigative committee. And there's a, uh, basically they're discussing those things on the level of the state Duma. So, yeah, I mean, when this court uh, or tribunal begins to work, apart from the obviously Ukrainian war criminals, including Mr. Zelensky himself and a bunch of other things, there will be many foreign leaders and foreign uh, luminaries who will be named and will be charged. They will have uh, charges leveled at them. And so... Uh, basically, that's what is in works now, and I agree with you, it's war crime. But then again, listen, you have to understand, and again, look at the elites and the Western elites. For them, Ukrainians are just cannon fodder, they are ubermensch, you know, so untermensch, uh, you know, as the Nazis were saying. So what can I say? Those idiots, they still consider themselves, they are really, the, you know, be conscious, but they are not. And again, I repeat this again, oh, and especially when Ben Wallace says it. Ben Wallace is an idiot. You know, he won't be allowed to command a company in the Russian army, you know. So, but that's pretty much everything you, uh, it reflects or uh, applies equally to just about any uh, military political leader, you know, in the combined West. And again, they, for them, Russians or Ukrainians, they are uh, untermensch subhumans, you know, why don't we throw them, you know, into this and, you know, meat grinder. And now when we have those numbers and even uh, 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 Mr. Kavoli, four-star general, the supreme commander of the NATO forces in Europe, he had to admit in January, speaking to this Polish, you know, uh, a Swedish forum, which you can easily find, his uh, quote is, scale, scale, scale. We never saw that we will see anything like this. We are not prepared to fight it because the scope and scale of this is beyond. And again, as I already stated, uh, now when they see those numbers, and we're talking, as I already stated, more than a million casualties on Ukrainian side, the nation is effectively destroyed, it doesn't have economy, it relies completely on the handouts from the West, its military, uh, Effectively destroyed, is paralyzed now, and now obviously through that came complete destruction of mythology of the Western military might. It's actually have been exposed as pathetic and you know just very expensive junk. And so when you look at this, suddenly they begin to recognize that oh my God, we have the situation. And in the last uh, few days, you have this constant statements by uh, it, you know, like Jake Salomon, Mark Neely, that, oh, no, we cannot send the, uh, you know, F-16. Oh, no, we cannot fight Russia. We cannot accept Ukraine into NATO and things like that. So they are throwing this regime under the bus because they better save their butts and behinds. But believe me, again, as I already stated, I am positive 
absolutely uh, convinced that uh, when the time comes with the uh, war crime tribunal standing launching, which will be probably in both in Moscow and in Donetsk, uh, there will be many uh, luminaries, so to speak, Western luminaries like Ben Wallace, for example, or Ben, uh, you know, Boris Johnson pointed out as the war criminals. They will have those charges leveled at, the, at them and they will get justice maybe sometime by the end of their life or maybe who knows how their political situation will develop in especially in Europe, which will be disintegrating. Europe, look at France. So they have how, how do you see the way Zelensky was treated in this NATO summit, comparing to to the way he was treated to the to his uh, in his address to to Congress? What is the oh. difference there? It, it's is that it, it was so notable. How how do you see this? Oh, there's nothing to see. The memes are all over the place. Zelensky is the janitor. This morning, Garold Nixon sent me Zelensky as the UPS handler. So the guy was absolutely humiliated and was shown to him that you are nobody here, just go die. That's it. Again, again, I want to stress practically every single person in Washington, D.C., there are some exceptions, of course, in the U.S. Congress, they are bought, paid, you know, by the lobbyists of the military industrial complex and all kinds of the ethnic and religious lobbies. They consider uh, Ukrainians as a nation, the same as Russians, untermensch. They don't care if Russian children die. I mean, they don't care. So they are war criminals, many of them are. They have been financing those wars of aggression and genocidal wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Anyway, in Syria. So, what can I say? If you look, if if you see, Biden was telling after after Zelensky's frustration in that summit, Biden said he was considering the withdrawal of NATO invitation to Ukraine. How how, how I was thinking how how ridiculous is this? They're they're playing a game with Zelensky. This this administration, they're not getting it. So of course not. Of course not. Nobody believed that they will get into NATO, only except for their, the most fanatical idiots in Kiev, them, you know. So, and what can I say? I mean, again, it's too late now. Millions of people have been removed on the Ukrainian side from the battlefield. They will never return to normal life. So, you have another 8 million of the refugees my, many of them went to Russia, obviously. You have now uh, the other millions of people who are not just refugees, but uh, uh, basically labor migrants from Ukraine, because there's nothing, not much to do there. So now, you know, and you have the country which has no industry now, and it will have its uh, access to the Black Sea cut out as we speak. Uh, Odessa is being, uh, Odessa port is being blown to smithereens. So there you go. Uh, somebody needs to answer for that. Guess who, who it will be? The leaders of the West. Zelensky is the dead man walking. He will be offed probably by whoever uh, uh, now is his uh, security detail. People say it is SAS, Special Air Service from UK. Maybe it is uh, CIA. We don't know. But he will be offed one way or another. The guy is consummate war criminal. Yes, including those people who basically advised him. And now when they see the end game, I mean, they see the uh, mili milita military conclusion to all of that, obviously they begin to panic. Do you think that this war going to end this year or going to last longer? Uh, well, if to uh, look at the resources, what Ukraine has, because you can have only so many people who are cannon fodder. Uh, I think so. From the point of view of the intensity of the co uh, of the combat, it will end probably this year. But there is no guarantee. Depending on how, don't forget, Russia doesn't fight Ukraine. Russia fights NATO. And um, ultimatum of the December twenty one will very clearly states what Russia wants to accomplish. Ukraine is just a proxy. And again, don't forget, there are other fronts like like Syria, for example. It is a fundamental global conflict between the combined West and Russia and those countries who want to support Russia. 
So there you go. And um, as a result, who knows? Russia wants to demilitarize not just Ukraine, which already happened. Russia is demilitarizing, not NATO. And she's doing it damn effectively. You, with all that said, how do you see this war and how is it, it's, is it going to be peace talk with all these BRICS co countries together with, with the West, with the NATO countries, G7? Oh, oh, how do you see this? So, very simple. There will be no negotiations in a normal sense. There will be dictation of the conditions of the surrender on the Russian part. Those conditions have been already presented in the, uh, what's the name, ultimatum of the December 2021. So that's Russian conditions. If you don't want to, you will capitulate and you will submit to those conditions one way or another. What many people also do not understand, the war is a broader term. It's not just some military action. It is what military action creates the consequences political consequences, and we see ourselves what is happening to Europe. And again, what needs to be understood, and this is not to insult anybody, there are only three countries in the world which really run the world and define the, uh, basically its uh, uh, fates. It's United States, China, and Russia. Once these three make some kind of arrangement, Europe will be obviously, Europe already is humiliated and uh, so United States is desperately looking for the ramp off to save its face. I don't think so Russia will give them the ramp off, but still United States well, will be great, it's already greatly diminished. I mean already greatly diminished. But what is going to happen in the end will be not only the fact of the demilitarization of NATO and rolling it back, but it will be also the issue of the debt dollarization, and it will be uh, basically decided between this three how it's gonna happen. Nobody is interested in collapsing the United States either, believe me. There are no people in Kremlin who sit there, okay, let's collapse the United States on dollar like in one day and then see what happens. They, no, everybody wants the soft landing. There's nothing wrong with wanting to soft landing, but of course we have to keep in mind that the United States is by far not what it pretends to be. It is an important country, it is still superpower, but it is nowhere near as it was portraying itself. You know, it was a primarily the wizard of was, you know, some fairly old guy, you know, in fragile, hiding behind the, you know, green curtain. The United States is still important, of course. It's a superpower. But, again, there are three countries which need to make this arrangement. You said that the third country is China, and we see that we have a conflict between China and the and the United States in Taiwan. And when you look at the this this military bases of United States around China, you can understand the threat that China feels. And and how do you see this problem that 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 China and United States are facing on Taiwan? Uh, well, you know what? Uh, judging by the la uh, latest um, uh, um, events in the last months, Janet Yellen goes there, Mr. Blinken went there, although he was humiliated, but at, at least he went there and there were some establishment of the channels of communication. So the United States is definitely uh, uh, turning down its aggressive rhetoric because nobody wants to face the war. Oh, uh, uh, come on. If the United States faces the real combined arms war, the whole uh, military, uh, primarily mythology, American military mythology goes out of the window because it will be defeated. That is why, for example, again, Mr. Jake Sullivan says that we cannot fight Russia, we're not ready for that. Combined NATO, he, it's on record yesterday, you know. So, and the same goes now that uh, uh, turning down a little bit uh, and toning down the rhetoric because obviously, what are you going to do? Do they want to go nuclear? Well, then it's over for everybody, you know? So what's left? You, you, uh, United States is being right now literally kind of corralled, corralled into the position where it has to admit that it's <clears throat> not the big horn trade pretended to be, especially when considered the dis disaster in uh, uh, <clears throat> United States military industrial complex and war economy. And that it needs to negotiate. It needs to set up, you know, some kind of arrangement 
if it, of course, um, and, and again, listen, I am on record, I, I repeat it again. You cannot negotiate with these people in, who are currently in Washington, D.C. Unless some credible politicians and statesmen, most important, coming, uh, no, Democratic Party of the United States is all together. It's uh, some kind of the organized criminal organi a group organization, which what they do is they destroying the country, plain and simple. So, and um, this is not to say that uh, Republicans are much better, but at least, you know, uh, so, and when you look at this, yeah, who are you going to talk to? You cannot talk to Biden. The guy is most of the time is not there to start with, you know. The only people you can talk to who, but they do not have any uh, status. Susan Rice, who is the brain behind all this catastrophe. Obama, Michelle Obama, Clinton. Are you kidding me? And again, those are highly uneducated, uncultured people. You cannot even, they do not understand how to make an arrangement with people who have their history, which are much more profound and larger than this uh, of the United States. They bought into this BS of the, you know, American dominance, and now they see it going haywire. So, there you go. You see, you talk about these candidates of the United States. What we have, what we have in the United States, we have two Right now, we have Democratic Party, we have RFK Jr. He's talking about, he's against this war in Ukraine. He's, he's talking about uh, how, how, how wrong was that to participate in this war, to not negotiate with Russia. Do you see any future for him in this party? I don't know. It's difficult for me to say because basically what we have people in DNC and those who run this party, they're absolutely are crazy people. Not only they are amoral, but basically this whole woke culture. They basically try to uh, basically institute Shana's pedophilia and 72 genders, which is, uh, I mean, how will he survive? D DNC? I doubt it. You know, so, but we'll see. What can I say? Again, I wrote the book. It, it called disintegration. United States itself is on the verge of the implosion. Many people, the signs are all there, including the, I mean, basically we have, uh, it's a completely torn country. It's a completely torn country. It is, we have this heartland with the real Americans, you know, God-fearing and all that. And then you have those uh, cities, which they call them, so they think that they are so sophisticated. They're um, dumb as a stump, which you would expect from the graduates of the Ivy League humanities programs, but they consider themselves at least because they probably make more money than others. That's about their, most of them are morons. If you look attentively at, you know, their composition, Bill Gates, for example, the guy actually dropped out of the university, he never completed, he dropped out on the second year. That means he has no systemic education, yet because he is uh, parents and national security agency pushed his Microsoft, you know, to life. He thinks that he is the one who accomplished this, but you know what? It's such a garbage. The guy evidently has no even understanding what he is doing. He doesn't even have systemic education, and most of them they don't. And again, we're looking. At, that's a metaphysical problem now. now. I'm not against humanities degrees. Make no mistake. But humanities degrees nowadays, they absolutely are not adequate for running modern society, especially because technological part of it. And I'm not talking about the stupid technologies like iPhone and TikTok or whatever. That's, this is garbage. I'm talking about technologies such as energy production, macroeconomics, industrial de development, uh, uh, you know, basically space exploration. You cannot go there with the green journalism. You need to have a freaking solid engineering level, master's degree level engineering background to even grasp it. And so now you have all those, again, make no mistake, I, for example, lawyers are absolutely important. But when you have some political scientist who studies nothing, random facts, and call it science, and he, he comes and he needs to understand how the modern armies or armed forces operate, you cannot even explain to him how operation planning is done. Because as I, uh, General Latif stated, everything they know about warfare, for example, they know from the entertainment industry. 
They know it from Hollywood. There you go. Again, if Putin wants to negotiate, he needs a counterpart that, that's willing to negotiate. If we, if we were to pick one of RFK Jr. or Donald Trump, which one do you think would be better? Uh, uh, maybe RFK. Trump is the hot air balloon. I mean, he is, uh, he, gosh, he is one of the biggest shysters I ever saw in my life. The guy is as aggressive and as American exceptionalist as any of them. So, in fact, is and plus he is completely, I mean, completely controlled by Israel lobby. He is, he is the most uh, pro-Jewish and pro-Israeli uh, uh, president we ever saw. You know, so, and when you look at this, it's, uh, my gosh. But RFK Jr., at least he uh, hails from, well, political family, you know, which obviously it's very tragic history of this political family. But at least <clears throat> what he says now makes more sense than this bloviations by Trump and, you know, just repeating the same beaten to death slogan. And uh, again, I, uh, the first thing Trump did when he came to power, he saturated his administration with the neocons. So what can I say? <laughs> so yeah, Putin, I don't think so, Putin trusts Trump. Andre, just the last question. I wanted, I wanted to know that what's your take on Putin, what he did during the last 24 years for Russia? I think he's, a, he's, he's one of the most important men in the history of Russia. How do you see his performance, what he did for Russia and Russians? Uh, unparalleled. Uh, he is being compared now as the softer version, but uh, in the same large statue as Stalin. Some people compare him to, Pete, to, the, to Peter the Great. He is certainly an uh, immense figure, not only in Russia, He's the greatest statesman in the, of the century the world ever saw. And that is why he is fanatically hated by Washington, which produces some, you know, midgets and, you know, corrupt, uh, you know, units, basically, who are nothing more than just, <clears throat> you know, political prostitutes. And here's the guy who presents this principles and his message is heard around the world. And many in the world actually have huge sympathy towards him and won't partake in his vision. In this case, he's not just most important guy in Russian history, and I already stated, he is a softer, softer version of Stalin. And Stalin is a gigantic figure in Russian history. And again, yeah, Peter the Great, that's kind of the level. The Russians know what, they, they know who they have now, believe me. And yeah, uh, you know, his uh, 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 approval rating is through the roof. It's in the stratosphere. Thank you so much, Andre, for being with us. Now, I mean, what more can you say about that? I mean, <laughs> the, guy, the guy was on a roll. And, uh, and, and then, oh, there, there were other things. I, don't, I won't go into it because they were talking back about Yeltsin and I. Uh, how the West got him into power, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, you got to watch the video. You got to watch the video. I'll I'll put a link up to it at the bottom of this video so you can check it out uh, on YouTube and Rumble. But anyway, he went on about how Yeltsin, uh, if Yeltsin had stayed in power, uh, you know, and, and the West wanted to attack Russia, Russia would have just launched the nukes at the end of the world. That's that's you know once. You know, once your strategic survival is, is done and you realize you're not going to survive as a nation and you figure, well, what's the point of having a world without our, our country? That's the Russian's attitude. I mean, you have to understand that is the Russian and I imagine China's attitude as well. You know, what is the world without Russia? It's not a world worth living in. Let's end the world. And that's where the Western leaders just have no clue, you know, uh, but they're willing to fight a conventional war. And uh, let's let's hear <laughs> let's hear let's hear some of what he had to say. Uh, well, uh, you know, I I, I don't want to. I all right. Let's just say let's hear what he had to say about the conventional war and how Russia was prepared to fight it, and the United States and the West is not, and how they're 
basically destroying all the NATO equipment. And then um, I'll, I'll continue on with this. It might be all in the same clip of, of the, the numbers, uh, and this is horrible. Third iteration of the Ukrainian armed forces, and after this counteroffensive, we're looking at 26,000 KIAs in June. This morning, it is 12,000 KIAs aggregate for July. So we look what? At uh, roughly 40,000 KIAs <clears throat> in last month and a half. And multiplied by about two or three, that's so many, uh, that's how much you have in terms of the wounded. So we have more than 100,000 just in months and a half of casualties. No NATO country, especially the United States, can sustain this for more than a week, both technologically and let alone in terms of their casualties. When, when we look at the, the curve of casualties, of Russian casualty, it, it initially it was going up like this, then suddenly after two, three months, it came down drastically. You see how, how, how they managed to reduce these, the number of casualties on, the, on, on their part. How oh, where is, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. First, we need, when we have to, uh, we need, uh, when we compare the number of casualties, <clears throat> You have to keep in mind that much of the numbers, for example, in the Western informational uh, environment is provided by Kyiv regime. And this data, they basically lie all the time. In fact, is uh, I called it very early from the start. So there was no drastic, you know, in some particular tactical action, the, you know, uh, number of casualties or ratio could have gone from you know, one to 10 to one to three, for example. But Ukraine has never been able to equal or flatten this uh, 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 ratios for a simple reason. Again, combat effectiveness and appropriate tactics. So in fact is there are some, uh, I have to admit, I, I am myself kind of both, um, you know, I have been wondering, but I have to admit and uh, many people will accuse me of being biased, but uh, Russian defense ministry numbers on the Ukrainian casualties are most realistic, but even more so, they are very conservative. Russians actually undercount So, But even when you consider this, and then you have the, <coughs> basically, the data which begins to leak from Pentagon and NATO uh, outlets, uh, we're looking at this moment at this very moment, today, at the 19th of July, at something like 350 plus thousand killed and multiplied by two or two and a half. So we're looking at more than a million casualties on Ukrainian side. And this is all comes back when you say about those ratios, which amounts to mostly one to 10. And again, there were some uh, locations where, for example, when you operate the um, uh, multi-launch uh, uh, systems, uh, rocket systems, it could go as high as 1 to 17, for example. So um, when you look at this, yeah, the ratio of 1 to 10, 1 to 12 maintains itself steadily for the last year. So the Russians lost KIAs probably around 30,000, I would say so. But still... Don't forget, uh, it's a very forced economy mode in Russia, and Russians didn't start yet those big offensives, you know. They're primarily tactical at this stage, but uh, we have to expect that once this starts, we don't know what's going to happen to Ukraine. Now. And I, I believe him. I believe him. Um, he's saying that upwards of, uh, we've got 350,000 plus uh, dead Ukrainians, and I watched 1,000 people die yesterday. Uh, in Ukraine, and uh, and he's saying that there's one million casualties. Well, when you watch him talk about the Western leaders, it's just what's amazing is how little they care. These are narcissist, uh, just horrible people. Uh, well, I, I mean, Satan is on the planet, right? I want to call him Satanist. And uh, anyway, let's just keep uh, keep going. And then he did say. Uh, and I agree with this. He said the Russia, and the reason why Russia just went into Crimea back in 2014, uh, and the question was asked, he said, why didn't Russia go into, um, uh, to, to overthrow the, the overthrow of the government in Ukraine 
Uh, he said, well, we were just were not economically or, or militarily able back in 2014, but we've been gearing up for this war since then. And in 2023, uh, these are two different countries. So if Putin, if you love him or hate him, he did good. He did good by the Russians. And he's got, well, I guess he's got, good Lord, I think a 90% approval rating <laughs> or something like that. And, uh, you know, let's think about Biden. Uh, good God, maybe he's at 23%. I don't know. I don't even know how Democrats support that son of a gun. I mean, he's a complete babbling fool. Uh, 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 and, and by the way, I... I, I in the clips, I'll definitely put in what he had to say about Biden, <laughs> the Russians, what the Russians think of Biden. And, you know, the sad thing is they don't feel like they got anybody to negotiate because they think that everybody in the West are complete idiots. And I agree with them. Oh, my God. There's no Western leader that has a lick of intelligence. And I'll let him, uh, you know, he's well, you're watching the clips. Maybe you watched them already in the video. Uh, and there's just and then of course he goes on about the Western military equipment and uh, how it's just all expensive junk <laughs> and they're blowing the shit out of it. Oh my God, it was just I, I, it's just fabulous how this guy just expressed everything that I've been trying to tell you. Uh, oh, and then of course, um, well I, I I don't know I, I I won't put this on the video, but I don't know if you watched how Zelensky was treated at the NATO conference. Um, they made him look like a little mop. Uh, and if you've seen the pictures, I mean, they just, I mean, can you imagine this guy has totally destroyed his country? One million, and of course, Scott Ritter points out, but it's not just, okay, so you got 350,000 people dead or more because they're dying about a thousand a day now. So let's just say 352,000 because it's been two days since that number. Well, that was 14th. So what, what's today? The 20th. So now we can say about uh, 360,000 dead. And then, of course, you've got all the maimed and uh, left veterans coming back with limbs blown off. They're injured. Uh, so that's the other uh, uh, million. And then, of course, you've got, like Scott Ritter pointed out, all the guys with PTSD, they're going to come back. They, they get, they, you know, they got no functional life. They're, they're living on the streets. I don't know if you ever watched Saving Private Ryan. Remember the guy, the, 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 the character when he had no legs and... <laughs> He was, he was batshit crazy just doing drugs and everything, and he's sitting up in the mast going, oh, yeah, let's die, let's die, because it was exciting because he felt like he was living life again. Those guys have no lives, and I've had PTSD, and I know what it's like. And uh, you, you want to sink into alcoholism, and you're angry at the world, and you're angry at, you know. Anyway, Ukraine is destroyed, and these people don't care. It's just uh so, um, and then, of course, he did point out, and I'll put that, let's cut to that clip now. Europe is disintegrating. All right, so that's what he had to say about Europe disintegrating. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, you're just a Republican lunatic. You know, all you want to talk about is Trump, 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 Trump. Well, no, I, I vote for DeSantis. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, the DeSantis is good. I just think he just... I'd prefer him just to stay here in Florida and support Trump. But let's watch what the Russians had to say about Trump. So you see, I'm trying to be fair. He didn't like Trump, so there you go. Uh, by the way, um, so you, and he liked RFK, so there you go. And then, uh, uh, well, and of course, he, he did point out, well, I, I don't know if he did or had this note from some other place. Trump did put a lot of neocons in his in his administration. So that showed either poor judgment or that Trump may kind of be a neocon himself. Uh, I'm willing to entertain that thought. And uh, and then, of course, um, boy, I don't know if you, <laughs> if you watched the trial. <laughs> oh, my God. There was a censorship trial on Capitol Hill where they invited JFK to speak out about the vaccines uh, or the vaccine mandates and all of that stuff. I, I can't talk about these things on YouTube, so I, 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 I want this video to go up on YouTube and stay there. Uh, but, I mean, you can at least watch the trial, I, and I don't have any footage of that. But it was, it was, they were trying to censor JFK at the censorship trial. <laughs> I mean, the Democrats, the warmongering Democrats were trying to censor JFK at the censorship trial. I mean, it was just unbelievable to watch. And he's a Democrat. 
I mean, what the hell is going on? I mean, the whole Democrat Party is just disintegrated into a freaking lunatics. I mean, my God, here's your number one candidate. I mean, don't tell me Biden is. You got JFK, and they want to censor their number one candidate at a censorship trial. I mean, and the Republicans were the ones defending him. They were saying, no, let him speak, man. We want to hear what he's got to say. Oh, my God. Who, who's going to vote Democrat? Are you a freaking idiot? I mean, these people are, are lunatics. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, bricks. Oh, my God. I didn't even. Well, Italy. Italy now is going to join. Uh, they're, they're, they want to settle in Russian rubles. So they're getting away from the dollar. So now we got, well, I want to say, I think it's, uh, it's 41 or 44 countries now. They're all meeting in August to get away from the dollar. And so what is the Federal Reserve proposing? Well, they're, we're going to go to a central uh, bank digital currency. And then they're going to give everybody a universal basic income. Well, I mean, I guess that's good. You know, if you want to get a chip in your arm and, and that's the only way you can buy groceries. I don't know if I'm going to go there, I, but I imagine a lot of young people or people that are struggling. What are you going to do if that's the only... Well, and it's not money. I mean, but I, I don't see how this thing's going to work. You know, maybe leave a comment below because if you're not producing anything and all you got is a service industry and all you can do is print digital digits on a computer and say this is now money, um, but it doesn't represent anything. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by oil. It's not backed by any commodities. How's that going to work? Maybe, uh, maybe if you're a banker or somebody, you can explain to me how that, that's going to work. I don't, I don't see how it's going to work, but I hope it doesn't. Holy shit. Can you imagine uh, the federal government being able to track every single thing you do? By the way, there was a, a, a proposal by um, Rand Paul today. <laughs> he said that, you know, because now we've said that we're going to adhere to the NATO agreement over the U.S. Constitution. And so Rand Paul put forward a, a proposition and he said, no. We need to adhere to the Constitution first, and then we will consider whether we will adhere to the NATO agreement. And it got voted down by rhinos and uh, Democrats. And that's why I say, you know, the Republicans are not your solution. Uh, but they're, they're better than the unanimous Democrats that vote against everything in your interest. Uh, so, so it's kind of like Rubin says, you know, you... You can't vote Democrat, but at least you got to think about voting Republican. <laughs> it's kind of the way it is. Uh, you know, and, and do your homework. Uh, so that was huge. And then, um, well, Bank of America, they're predicting $33,000 gold uh, very soon. And then the last thing is, uh, wow, this looks like Disney is going down. <laughs> and you watch the new dwarfs. They're not dwarfs. And I, I was watching Redacted tonight, and, and they were going on about, you know, well, don't you think dwarfs would want a job in Hollywood? And they were saying, well, that's racist to employ dwarfs, to play dwarfs in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And that it would be racist to employ a white woman to play Snow White, because she's called Snow White, because uh, that... that the whole woke wallet, I mean, so anyway, I don't, I don't see how Disney's going to survive. I mean, the, the people that are making the movies there, I mean, they have completely lost touch with reality. The last thing that's coming up, and we're going to, maybe I'll make a video on this here soon, is uh, Redacted's been doing a number of videos. Definitely watch Redacted. Um, UFOs, we've got a huge uh, uh, Schultz, or the Democrats and the Republicans have signed on and supposedly within the next couple, three weeks, we're going to get a lot of information about how the uh, defense uh, machine, um, the, the defense industrial complex has been doing a lot of research on UFO technology. And so now, you know, I'm kind of seeing where the, remember when Trump created the Space Force and everybody laughed at him. They said, why do we need the Space Force? Well, there's a guy on Redacted and he was saying, well, we're going to need these vehicles that we've been studying and reverse engineering now for probably since the 1950s uh, to go out into space and provide security for the Earth. Um, and this is all going to come out within the next couple months. 
I'm I'm riveted. <laughs> I mean, I'm riveted. I, I got an open mind about this whole thing. And, and and this is, I mean, the whole Congress voted for this, so that means that the military industrial complex who owns Congress is for it. And so this is going to bring everything out into the open so it can be part of the defense budget. Um, so we'll see where it all goes, man, I tell you. May you live in interesting times. So let's finish it off. And I hate to have to keep reading this, and I should be able to just do it. My, my brain don't work no more, man. After alcohol abuse and uh, falling downstairs and cancer twice, I have to read it. You can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Call that globalist liar. Go tell that Democrat writer. Tell that rhino rambler. Tell that nuclear war gambler. That backbiting U.S. politician. Tell them all that God's gonna cut them down. Tell them all that God's gonna cut them down. In the pauses between is when you move. There's no telling when the shells will start screaming in again. We are just a few hundred meters away from Ukrainian positions from ground zero. The uh, situation is such that Ukrainian troops have taken one of the forward trenches, small, relatively about 15, 20 meters across. But now uh, Russian airborne troops, considered elite, have arrived here and are ready to storm to assault the lost trench again. Earlier this morning, Ukrainian troops had assaulted that position from three directions. The Russian contingent was ordered to pull out so artillery could do its work. It did. They're pulling out their dead. There are five Ukrainians in one spot. Come, take a look. There, they're carrying one of theirs in a bag. And these two are digging. As Russian artillery hit them, Theirs hit back. The purpose of this seemingly aimless Ukrainian bombardment was to prevent a counterattack. They used everything, howitzers, mortars and rockets. We even filmed one fly by. A recon squad of the 76th Airborne Division set to work, quickly driving the Ukrainians into cover and then blasting them with grenades, one after another. It was too much. They broke. We watched as the surviving Ukrainian troops surrendered. One by one, they stumbled out with hands in the air. They were all taken in. Ours wasn't the only drone in the air. Ukrainian commanders, seeing their troops surrendering, must have ordered fire on their own soldiers. It wouldn't be the first time. The day was done. Dawn to dusk, it had been filled with explosive violence and bloodshed, and all for nothing. The front line had remained unchanged. Tomorrow, it would all begin again. Morad Gazdiev, RT from Kremenaya, Lugansk region.